Do you know why a decade is crazy? Because CM Punk left the WWE in the last 10 years. And genuinely, if you sit down and think about that, it kind of feels like it happened in 1962. It feels so long ago, and yet it wasn't. It happened within this 10 year period. I can't believe it. That also means there's been some amazing times and some amazing moments since 2010 all the way up to the end of 2019. And that is what we're gonna concentrate on today. Because my name is Simon Miller. You are watching What Culture Wrestling. This is the 10 best moments of the decade when it comes to WWE. Number 10, The Shield debut. I don't think you can understate how important The Shield's debut at Survivor Series 2012 was. I mean, WWE put these three guys together because they wanted them to be future world champions. And before the decade was out, Roman Reigns was a multi-time champion, Seth Rollins was a multi-time champion, and Dean Ambrose just barely was a multi-time champion. I never knew why he didn't get his due. Everything about their presentation was just so cool though. That whole Lima, Echo, Sierra, whatever else they say. And they came out in those like flak jackets and they looked like an army that were going to war. And I know when they debuted, they had polo necks on, but everyone realized that was a terrible idea and they changed it, but it felt fresh and it felt exciting. And I know that loads of people were talking about this after the fact. And if you went into, I don't think it was NXT then, whatever the hell it was called, if you went into that, you're like, who the hell are these three guys? And how the hell have they been allowed to get into the main event and beat up all these top stars? It's more things like this we should be doing today. And I don't know why we aren't, because again, Seth Rollins leading Raw, Roman Reigns, leading SmackDown. I mean, John Moxley, former Dean Ambrose, is kicking ass on AEW. He may be the best wrestler of 2019. You could argue that. The Shield. Let's never forget how good The Shield were. They were brilliant. Number nine, NXT lands on the USA Network. If I had told you in 2010 that the reality show known as NXT was going to become one of the hottest properties that WWE has and make it onto actual television, you would have punched me in the face because you'd be like, Simon, you have just wasted my time. One day I'm going to be on my deathbed and I'm going to have to remember this stupid conversation I had with you. As it turns out, I was absolutely right, although complete transparency, I never thought that was going to happen. But not only did it survive that time, because when it was a weird reality show, it was kind of controversial because a lot of people thought it sucked, but it went on to become the developmental league for Raw and for SmackDown before taking the biggest step of all and saying, hey, we are now WWE's third brand. And it moved on to USA Network and it started a damn wrestling war. You have to give credit where credit is due though. So to go from something that nobody watched to something that around about 800,000 people are watching on the USA Network alone, well, it's a round of applause all around. And if you wanna give an extra couple of thumbs up to Triple H for this decade proving, by the way, I may be really good at this wrestling shtick, well, you can do that too. Also, Adam Cole's been leading that brand recently. He is absolutely brilliant. So we ticking boxes all around. Number eight, Brock Lesnar kills the streak. It is one of the most monumental things that we saw over the last 10 years, and it's still something that divides opinion today. Should WWE have ended the undefeated streak? Was Brock Lesnar the right man to do this? Or was this an absolute abomination that means we all go to sleep with tears in our eyes? I wake up some days thinking it was the right thing and other days thinking it was the worst thing we've ever done. If we take it as it is, you can't say it didn't have huge benefits. I mean, WWE is still using the fumes Brock Lesnar got from that to keep him as a monster. And you know, to be fair, the Undertaker was already not the wrestler he once was because Father Time would always sneak up and whoop your ass. So if you were gonna pull the trigger, maybe WrestleMania 30 was actually the right time. If nothing else, it was responsible for giving us that incredible reaction from the WWE faithful, and you never see anything like that anymore. There was real emotion, people thought it was a botch, people refused to believe it, but it was true. And as soon as that one popped up on 21 and one and Paul Heyman was losing his mind, it was like someone had reached into your heart and torn it out. And it makes sense, you reach into a heart, you reach into somebody's body and you tear it out, but that's what it was like. And the heart kept on beating, and then Brock Lesnar ate it and he spat it on your face, and you realized WWE wasn't PG anymore. And you could argue whether this should be in a list of best moments, but it changed the trajectory for so many things. It sent the beast up to the top, and it completely redefined what we would say when talking about the dead man. I think it needs to be here. Number seven, the creation of All Elite Wrestling. As much as it tried to be, let's face it, TNA was never actually real competition for WWE. Ever since World Championship Wrestling closed its doors in 2001, Vince McMahon has been able to run wild across the wrestling industry, and that wasn't what was best for business. You always need someone looking at you from afar because it keeps you motivated and it keeps you fresh. And that is why when in 2019, All Elite Wrestling became a real thing, 
is the best for everyone. Because not only did the formation of All Elite Wrestling get a few old fans interested, but even if you were a current supporter, you had to take a look across the pond to see what was going to down. All of a sudden, look what it did for Wednesday nights. We just talked about NXT on Wednesday nights. You're flipping over to AEW, you're flipping over to NXT, or you're DVRing and you're watching both and you're excited about the ratings. It made the whole business feel exciting again, and I think that's something we've been missing. And who knows what the future will bring? And also, all of this has put the power back in the wrestler's hands because nobody wants their guys to go to the other product because it's like a slap in the face. As I say these words, we don't know where Marty Skrull or Luke Harper is gonna go, but everybody's talking about it, everybody's chatting about it, and everybody believes if someone like Luke Harper does turn up in AEW, he may finally get the joy that he's been looking for. And sooner or later, when we're used to All Elite Wrestling, that will start happening the other way too. People will jump from there over to WWE. It's like an injection of excellence right into your veins, and I applaud it massively. Number six, Kofi Mania. At the very start of this decade, any hope there was for a Kofi Kingston main event push seemed to have died in 2009, where Randy Orton got in his face and went, stupid, stupid just because he didn't like take a punt or an RKO properly. I mean, gee whiz. He was also always going after secondary titles like the United States Championship or the Intercontinental title. And while I think most people actually like Kofi, it never looked like he was going to hit the top until we got to the very last 12 months. But by 2019, Kingston had rebranded a little bit thanks to the New Day, and he did have a little bit more edge about him. Throw that in with some open-ended plans when Ali got injured, and all of a sudden it did seem like Vince McMahon and WWE were ready to give Kofi the World Championship. And as soon as us as fans realized that, and as soon as we remembered everything that Kingston has done well, from 2010, we got so behind it, we got emotionally invested, and when he won that title from Daniel Bryan at WrestleMania 35, well, it hit me right here. It was absolutely glorious. And sure, it sucked when he lost it in 11 seconds after SmackDown debuted on Fox to Brock Lesnar, but don't worry about that. Remember everything that happened from April up till September where we had a beloved babyface who would go into every single match and win clean thanks to a trouble in paradise. Nobody can ever take those memories away. And again, what an inspiration is Kofi Kingston to go from where he was in 2019 to the biggest match at WrestleMania 35? He a damn hero. Number five, the Roman Reigns comeback. Say what you want about Roman Reigns, but when he did announce that he had to leave WWE in late 2018 because his leukemia had come back, it was one of the worst and just one of the most hurtful things that we had seen in professional wrestling for some time. You can take your promos and your storylines and your angles and you can throw it over there because this was as real as it gets and everybody just wanted him to get better. And that's why when he took a microphone in February 2019 and looked down the camera lens and simply said, I'm in remission, y'all, it was one of the best things. Not only we've seen this decade, but maybe throughout the entirety of wrestling history because you couldn't help but have a lump in your throat or a tear running down your cheek. And if you didn't, your heart is simply made of stone. And once again, I'm gonna come and get it and grab it and throw it on the floor. We talked about that once, I'll do it again. If nothing else, it took real balls for the big dog to do this in front of millions of people, especially because he had to have his treatment under that microscope as well. And the really crazy thing now is that nobody thinks about that, which on one side is actually really good because it means we've moved on and he's just living a normal life. But another, it will absolutely send you crazy. I mean, how is he not the biggest and the most beloved baby face ever? But again, who cares about that? Throw it over there, it doesn't matter. Seeing Roman Reigns get over cancer of all things, one of the best things I've ever seen in my damn life. Number four, the Shawn Michaels swan song. So this is a weird one because we're only talking about 2010, but that still counts when you're referring to the decade. And how on earth can we not mention Shawn Michaels finally retiring from pro wrestling? aside from that thing he did in 2018. But there's a really easy way to get around that. Just don't think about it. So when he went toe to toe with The Undertaker for the second time at WrestleMania 26 with his career on the line, it was one of the most defining moments we saw over the last 10 years. And we still have the debate, we still have the argument, what was better, this match or the one they did the year before? But ultimately, it doesn't actually matter. These two went out there and had some of the best WrestleMania matches we'd ever seen. And the emotion once again was real because this time we were saying goodbye to one of the best professional wrestlers in history. If you were a long-term fan as well, seeing this all came to an end felt like a surreal dream because you'd grown up on the Rockers and you'd seen him enter G Generation X and then leave WWE entirely because he had a back injury and his career was over, then come back in 2002 and essentially, you know, have an eight-year second career that may have been better than the first part of his career. I mean, how was this 
ever going to come to a closure. Thought it was going to go on forever. His swan song as a solo act then was absolutely beautiful and it's why it sneaks its way onto this list, even though I know a lot of people are going to be pulling their hair out because they think it's absolutely crazy. But if you know, you know, and if you don't know, well, you missed it to begin with. Number three, CM Punk's Pipe Bomb promo. We already mentioned CM Punk at the start of this video, but now we get into it again, because my word, in 2011, when CM Punk did take that pipe bomb in his hand and start saying things that you could not believe were actually coming out to his mouth, it took him from like upper mid-card level right up into the stratosphere. He redefined what a promo was meant to be in a matter of minutes as he tore down John Cena, Stephanie McMahon, Vince McMahon, Triple H, and even mentioned other companies like Ring of Honor and his good friend, Colt Cabana. It was like he had just torn up the script and he didn't care anymore. He also absolutely hated the procedures and structure that was happening within WWE, and boy howdy, he wasn't gonna obey it any longer. He was here to shake up the system. He was here to be the voice of the voiceless. And at one stage you were like, has he actually gone into business for himself? Because I can't remember anyone else being allowed to say shib like this. The key to it as well was that he was speaking from the heart and he meant every single damn word he said. Just somehow he got Vinnie Mac to sign off on it. It was because of this he became one of the longest reigning champions of the modern era and it's because of this he found a way to become an absolute megastar. I mean, if he, the old CM Punk, I should say, walked out in 2014, people would have been surprised. But when this version of CM Punk walked out in 2014, nobody could actually believe it. I remember people refreshing news sites like, no way, no way, no way, no way, but it was true. You can still watch this back now and it will give you chills because it's absolutely timeless. And you try and come here and tell me this hasn't inspired many an interview ever since. It was revolutionary and it was groundbreaking. CM Punk deserves all the plaudits for it. Number two, Daniel Bryan's WrestleMania 30 win. When CM Punk successfully remodeled how WWE saw him back in 2011, Daniel Bryan must be paying attention because he was another guy that Vince McMahon was never going to get behind properly. He was too small, he was a vegan, he didn't do any of the things that McMahon liked. And yet at WrestleMania 30, which is arguably the biggest WrestleMania of the entire decade, it was the man who liked to say yes standing there with two belts aloft after he had beaten Randy Orton and Dave Bautista, two guys who you know the boss absolutely loved. The point was though, is that the people, the fans, we didn't care. We picked our new hero for a generation and his name was Daniel Bryan and we just wanted to see him go all the way to the top. So all the bad booking and being told he's nothing more than a B plus player, we sat there or we stood and we continued to chant his catchphrase until we absolutely took over an entire episode of Raw and the powers that be were like, we have absolutely no choice. We have to go with it. It was beautiful. And the best bit about this is when they did finally decide to go with it, they gave it all to Daniel Bryan. He had to beat Triple H in the opening match just to get to the main event. And not only did he did that, he tapped out Dave Bautista, the Hollywood actor, to become the world heavyweight and WWE champion. I mean, I can't stress how amazing this was and how it just took the rule book and ripped it up and threw the pages everywhere. A sense of relief washed over the New Orleans masses this night. And if you need a way to put it into context, this was going after, or at least following, the Undertaker streak dying, which had left people in a state of genuine shock. But Daniel Bryan, he was so over and he was so beloved when they saw that he won, no one even cared. Daniel Bryan is one of the best wrestlers ever. Number one, women headline WrestleMania. No moment in the last 10 years deserves to be higher than this one, even though it came a little bit too late. This isn't about Becky Lynch and Charlotte Flair or even Ronda Rousey. This is about how, well, basically awful women have been treated in WWE and how finally they had made it to the top where they belonged. I was an avid watcher of the Attitude Era and even then I knew that something wasn't kosher. But now you go back and you look at some of the stuff that was done in the late 90s and it is absolutely offensive and you can't even fathom who decided this was a good idea. And I know it was aimed at horny teenage boys, but still. WWE had always treated female performers as nothing more than a sideshow. Or if we're talking about that era, just as people that should get into mud or hit each other with pillows and it just wasn't right. No one actually sat there and thought, oh, these women can draw money or these women should be in a position to draw money. And when some of them actually went to management and asked to have wrestling matches, they were told, no, women shouldn't wrestle like men. That's disgusting. That's why the likes of Becky Lynch, Charlotte Flair, Ronda Rousey, Sasha Banks, 
Bailey, Emma, Paige all came together over a matter of years to ensure this idea changed and nothing cements that more than the main event of WrestleMania 35 when you did get Becky, Charlotte and Ronda in the last match. It was a victory for all of them, every woman under contract and every young female wrestling fan that has invested their time in the product. So if 2010 to 2020 has done one thing right, it's shine a spotlight on those who work the hardest. And in this sense, it was the women's division and it was that damn main event. Now of any other amazing WWE moments in the last decade, let us know in the comments below and don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Then head to whatculture.com and read yourself some articles. Follow what culture at WhatCultureWWE on Twitter. Watch more videos here on What Culture Wrestling. My name is Simon from What Culture. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you again soon.